Hello, I am Steve Huffner, the Deputy Director of the Election Law Program here at The Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you today to another in a series of conversations that we've been hosting about the ability of various electoral structures to best operationalize the idea of representative democracy. As I'm sure many of you know, last November we hosted an opening event in this series on the problem with plurality winner elections. In that conversation, we wrestled with the counter-majoritarian problems that have arisen because most states award political offices to whichever candidate receives the most votes, even if that candidate has not received a majority of the votes. Yet nothing mandates the use of this so-called plurality winner system. And a few states have long insisted on a runoff between the top two candidates if no candidate has received a majority in the initial election. And an increasing handful of states have begun moving to the use of ranked choice ballots to conduct an instant runoff. Then, six weeks ago, in another event, we extended this conversation by exploring in more depth the new system that Alaska has adopted beginning this year for determining a true majority winner in its general election. This Alaska process is structured atop a revamped primary election system that no longer relies on a partisan primary, but pits all candidates against each other in one single event from which four candidates emerge for the general election. And today it is our opportunity to consider the recently concluded North Carolina primary election for the open U.S. Senate seat there, the results of which I'm going to capture on this slide now. And we'd like, to to, we'd like to use this contest as another case study to consider the impacts on majority rule. And I'm going to, uh, I don't see the slide showing up yet, but I was hoping we'd share. Okay, so this is the slide uh, that captures the results of the recently concluded primary in North Carolina. And we'd like to think about this case study as a way to further discuss what alternative electoral structures might mean. Um, the traditional party primaries often have the effect of eliminating from the general election true consensus candidates who would have had broad support among the electorate. But instead, we often see two individuals from opposite ends of our partisan divide competing as the only viable candidate once we get to the general election, perhaps leaving the vast middle deserted. So let's get into this conversation today. We have invited four discussants to be part of a roundtable discussion and our discussants are in the order in which I'm going to give them each an initial question. Don Vaughn, North Carolina politics reporter at the News and Observer as well as the president of the North Carolina Capitol Press Corps. Then Sunshine Hillegas, who's a professor of political science as, as well as a professor in the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. Then Guy Uriel Charles, who is the Charles Ogletree Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, as well as uh, a former law professor at Duke in North Carolina as well, so with deep ties to the, the, the state there. And then Edward Foley, who is the Ebersold Chair in Constitutional Law and my colleague here at the Moritz College of Law, where he is also the director of our election law at Ohio State program. Now, we have not asked these discussants to prepare or make formal presentations, but as the moderator, I'm going to begin the discussion by asking each of them a separate initial question and invite them to take just a few minutes for their initial response. And then after these four starter questions, we'll open things up for the roundtable discussion. We also welcome your submission of questions through the question and answer feature in the Zoom uh, panel at the bottom of your screen. So with that, Don, let me turn to you first and ask you, what do you make of the just concluded Republican primary there in North Carolina for the U.S. Open Senate seat? and what turned out to be a surprisingly lopsided win uh, that, that Bud was able to accomplish over his, his um, other most viable Republican candidate, uh, Pat McCrory. Right, well, th thanks for having me. So 
On the Democratic side, it was already a given because the, the Democrats had aligned behind Sherry Beasley as, as the candidate. And it was a, a bigger field that her main um, opponent, Jeff Jackson, had dropped out to run for U.S. House seat. So on the Senate side, it really came down to Pat McCrory, the former governor, and Ted Budd, uh, already a member of Congress, but maybe not on the statewide radar that McCrory has been, um, because he was also mayor of Charlotte and been around for a while from all North Carolinians, New Haywoods, as well as the, um, of course, Republicans. So the, the thing that we all watched and you can predict and poll and, you know, whatever you say, you still don't know until election day how things are going to turn out. Um, so we thought it, could, it might have ended up closer with Bud and McCrory, but it absolutely didn't. Um, so there are a couple of different factors for, for why um, we can surmise that, uh, that Bud won. Um, part of it is the outside spending, the super PAC club for growth that spent a lot of money on, on him. He had Trump's endorsement, but we haven't seen that um, way as much, you know, this primary round nationwide. So that's certainly a factor, but maybe not a, a large factor as much as outside spend, spending. And then Bud himself versus versus McCrory. McCrory is already a known, and maybe Republicans and others, you know, unaffiliated voters put in the primary weren't as interested in sending him to the Senate as they were for someone like Bud. Great. And I've already got some follow-ups that I can think about, but I'll go ahead and, and turn next to Sunshine and invite Sunshine to think about the process that North Carolina has been using, which is the typical process uh, in which parties pick candidates and often and increasingly perhaps tend to pick party stalwarts or even party firebrands uh, to then compete head to head in the general election with some third parties potentially in there as well. Is that a good way to narrow or winnow the field for the general election? or does it in some sense sometimes distort the choice that electors have? Would a different electoral system design better um, reflect voter preferences? And, and I actually, I wanna start by uh, pushing back a little bit on the question because, because I, I think that from my view, this um, idea that, that both the, the, the Trump endorsed candidate rather than kind of the moderate who has experience um, one in the Senate race, but also in, in a couple of the congressional races where, again, you had the, the more moderate and kind of establishment um, candidate lose out to um, a political outsider with Trump support, um, that I wouldn't attribute that to party, right? I would attribute that, um, in fact, to the weakness um, of the party um, in the process. I mean, I, I think it's important to, to take into account that um, that turnout in a primary, uh, you know, although turnout was up relative to um, the last midterm election, it's still, you know, a third of, of the electorate. Um, it was quite um, asymmetric, it sounds like, in, in this election cycle, where there was um, a sharp increase, a, a much larger increase in turnout among Republicans. And so, um, you know, I, I think that that in, in some in many cases, right, like that, that I want to attribute it not to what the party actually necessarily thought from party leadership would be um, the right candidate to put forward, um, but rather, uh, as you say, it, it's more an artifact of the particular system um, that we have. And, and so, um, you know, um, in North Carolina, you know, uh, getting over that 30 percent, um, you know, means it that that becomes a person who is the the nominee um and is not necessarily going to be the best nominee um in, in terms of the the general election and so um it's absolutely the case that that both in terms of the primary structure um the election laws um that allow you know who to 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 vote um and um you know just the um you know every single part of the um, election administration is relevant for who shows up um, and uh, what the outcomes are likely to be. And, and absolutely, you know, I think an important conversation is about um, is this the, the, the way that we want um, the, 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 the will of the people to be aggregated? Um, and, and I think separate from some of the conversations that 
um, you know, I've had with Ned uh, previously, like one of the things that as a public opinion scholar, I want to make sure that we bring into the conversation is this piece about turnout, right? That it's not simply a matter of how we aggregate um, the votes, but also who is, is part of, um, you know, who shows up um, to actually vote. And, and, and the, the fact that we have a system um, in which you have 30%, and, and in some states, right, if there's a runoff, you can get even smaller percentages of the electorate that, that is essentially getting their preference um, to, to move ahead to the, to the general election. So um, I hope the conversation ends up talking about, you know, um, you know, primaries overall, um, is that the right way? Um, um, you know, also in, you know, nonpartisan versus partisan primaries and first past the post, um, but also gerrymandering and also um, some, some, you know, uh, you know, who, who is, is able to, to show up and, and cast a ballot because all of these things are, are very important to the outcomes that we see. Right. Thanks, Sunshine. Yeah, there's a very rich set of ideas here for us. And I especially want to keep thinking about the way in which the weaknesses of the political parties today overlaid on party primaries that may have arisen in an era when there was a stronger party system are creating a dynamic today that we need to wrestle with. And so, Guy, I'll turn to you next, and you can ignore entirely what I've just said if you wish, but I'm curious just to hear a little bit about your take uh, on the effect, you, your take of the effect of an electoral system's design on the stability writ large of our democracy and our democratic process. And, you know, that is to say, are there features of the traditional two-party system that we've come to know and love, in air quotes, that are now sowing the seeds of its own destruction? And, and so anyway, what's your opening thought, Guy? Yeah, I mean, so my thoughts are um, follow along the lines of the discussion in a couple directions. Uh, one is an era of significant polarization um, effective polarization, uh, where uh, Americans, at least at the elite level and political scientists debate to what extent that's true of the rank and file American, uh, seem to be very divided. And the extent to which those divisions mirror, the political divisions mirror uh, or overlaid on top of our um, um, socioeconomic divides, whether that's race, whether that's um, um, whether that's uh, other social religion, um, ethnicity, other types of socioeconomic divides. Um, at the same time, uh, we have an American um, electoral system that is reflective of um, 18th and 19th century choices um, that has, it, it was built essentially for an electorate that um, was uh, relatively homogenous. It didn't really account for, say, Native Americans or African Americans or um, or people of Asian Asian descent, uh, Chinese Americans who were largely excluded from from the electoral system, um, right? And where the divisions were mainly geographical, uh, largely north and south. Um, so in the 21st century, you have a multicultural group of people. Um, it, it, the divisions are not the way that they were before. You have an electoral system that is creaky, that is old, um, that, and then you overlay that on top of a, um, a, a set of polarized, um, a polarized electorate. And then you also overlay that on top of a constitutional as well as um, legislative process uh, that is not responsive and reflective of the types of 21st century challenges that we have, right? So they can't, it can't ad ad adapt and, and, um, and address the challenges that we have with the level of flexibility that one would want, um, right? So, uh, so we find ourselves in many ways in a moment of crisis as a function of a set of um, structural changes that are that are baked in, and then now we're trying to address right to what extent can we um, modify those changes by the way that 
uh, we organize our politics, whether it's top two, whether it's North Carolina, whether it's instant runoff voting, right? So what are the effects that these structural changes are going to have? Um, and is it possible for those structural changes to be much more responsive to the 21st century set of politics um, that we have today, as opposed to the 18th, 19th, and even mid 20th century politics, which is a very different set of politics than than we have now two decades in to the, the 21st century, right? So I think this is the right set of conversations to, to, to have. We do need an updating of our fundamental systems. And then the question is whether these are the right moves right what are the factors that we know what are the factors that are unanticipated that are going to have an impact on what it is that we're doing um and i and i right, so it, it's we can't fully say where it is that we're going to go but i but i firmly believe that this is the right conversation to have when you have an electorate that is as diverse um that is as different uh, and overlaid with um, the types of divisions that we currently have, um, can we structure our politics to be to address those types of problems and to be much more dynamic and responsive, both in outcome, but as well as in, 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 in terms of process? Great, thanks, Guy. So, Ned, I know that you've been devoting a lot of thought to the possibilities of some alternative electoral system designs, including principally things that would pick what political scientists call the Condorcet candidate, that is, the candidate that does best against all other candidates when evaluated head to head. Can you give us sort of a very short summary for now of, of your thinking here before we open things up? Sure, thanks, Steve, and, and I'm thrilled to be having this conversation with, with everybody involved. Um, you know, what, as someone who's not in North Carolina and observing from the outside, what seems um, very interesting and is important as a case study is, you know, we have three candidates. Obviously, one has been eliminated, McCrory, sending two, the two primary winners, to the general election but uh, at least raises the question in my mind whether the eliminated candidate here, McCrory, might have been what Steve called the so-called Condorcet winner, that terminology coming from an 18th century French political scientist uh, who observed this phenomenon. I, I like to think of it as the round robin winner because as Steve said, you kind of imagine each candidate compared to every other candidate like a round robin sports tournament. And um, um, and so you know, without you know polling data that would show this one way or the other, we can only speculate whether if in November, and this goes to I think to Sunshine's point about turnout and the difference between primary voters and who gets to vote versus November voters, you know, if the November voters in North Carolina had a choice of these three finalists. Um, what would be their preferences? How would we think about their preferences? It seems pretty plain that the people that turned out in the primaries, in the Republican primary, there's no doubt that Bud, <laughs> you know, um, completely decisively beat McCrory. So yes, uh, Bud is the is the Republican uh, primary choice. But what about the the November choice? And part of the reason why I asked this question at sort of this moment in American history to pick up on Guy's point about this is that, you know, when you look at these three candidates in North Carolina, they do represent these larger forces in American politics. So we've got a Democratic nominee that represents the Democratic Party uh, as, as well as she should. And then we've got these two different Republican candidates. The dominant one, as Bud clearly indicates, is the Trump endorsed part of the Republican Party. But that comes with the baggage of the so-called big lie, right? Um, part of the reason why Bud was attractive to Trump was that Bud embraced this false claim that Trump won the 2020 election and is part of the Trump effort to repopulate the American political system with the so-called election denialists, which some of us, including myself, fear for the system as a whole. 
So, you know, as I think about which of these three candidates might occupy a seat in the U.S. Senate, it's not just an issue of what are their policy preferences and making sure we get the candidate that the voters of North Carolina most want, which is important in a democracy, but it's about sustaining the democracy from one election to the next, because if you have enough election denialists sitting in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House, they could subvert future elections. So I think we have to pay attention to that as well. So, um, you know, it may be that the Democrat, you know, to pick the, the go back to the notion of the Condorcet winner, it might be that Beasley as the Democratic nominee could beat either Republican in the fall. North Carolina is a purple enough state, as I understand it, you know, and, and uh, Democrats have won statewide elections. Um, for governor and for other races that, you know, the Democrats have a fair shot at winning the race, regardless of which nominee the Republicans choose. Now, we all know that this year is 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 looking to be like a not a very good year for the Democrats. So it may be that either Republican candidate in North Carolina, a purple state, would have a pretty good chance against the Democrat. Um, but, you know, is, is, so it is possible, I think, we have to acknowledge that Bud might be Beasley, just because Bud is the Republican nominee. But if you had a three-way race in November that tried to identify the Condorcet winner, would McCrory, even though he got clobbered in the primary, would he win head-to-head -head races one-on-one -on -one against each of the other two, such that a majority of North Carolinas in November would prefer him to either of the other party nominees. That's sort of the question that I think we ought to be exploring, not just to figure out who's the best candidate for the electorate as a whole, so, but how to think about democracy preservation. So can I ask Don to sort of react to that particular question and maybe make this a two-part question, Don, but, but the question Ned's putting out there now is what would happen if there were a three-way general election using uh, some way of evaluating the candidates that didn't just award the outcome to the plurality winner, but that instead assessed the relative strength of each of the three in head-to-head -head matchups against the other two. Um, do you have a sense that when the entire electorate, which again, as we've already said today, uh, is very different than the relatively small group of people who turn out in the primary elections, if the entire electorate had that choice, do you have a sense of how it would play out, Don? And then a second follow-up question from the chat that I just wanted to tee up, or from the question and answer for you right now is whether you have a sense of how many voters who didn't vote in the primary election, who might consider themselves Republican, would vote for Beasley in the general election because they didn't find themselves drawn to Bud. That's maybe a secondary question to the, the threshold question about a head-to-head -head of three candidates. So Dawn, sorry for that long windup. Now I know what it's like when I ask uh, elected officials a whole, a whole bunch of questions at once and they have to remember. Um, well, I mean, I'm old enough to remember, you know, when Ross Perot ran for, ran for president and you can see like whoever's closest to the candidate that may have been winning um, will, will, you know, draw from draw a significant number of those away but um i'm sure you all have, have different takes on on that and that was more of my like childhood memory of that election for a teenager um um I, I think i think that kind of would, would i think that that voters are susceptible to television ads and digital ads no matter if you don't wish that they weren't they are or uh these super PACs wouldn't spend so much money on them and when you have a larger candidate field, I think that people might pay less attention and might pick someone for, um, you know, not that they did all this research and studies and looked up their voting record and on what bills they sponsored, you know, if they were a lawmaker, all those sorts of things and decide like, yeah, I liked that ad. I didn't like that ad. I'd like them, don't like them for for this or that reason. So I don't know if more candidates would necessarily um, have have a significantly different result than if it was the, the, the two party system. When I, you know, I interviewed a lot of unaffiliated voters who are now the largest voting group 
in, in North Carolina, and they generally vote a certain way. But one thing that I found, I mean, either Democrat or Republican, is that they don't like the party system. They don't like being told what to do. And in North Carolina, you don't have to be told what to do. You can move here and just say, I'm unaffiliated and vote whichever primary ballot that you want. So I think that that is a big factor too, but the, the parties need, I guess rather the parties need candidates to align themselves with the party because of the infrastructure there and people who run for office and end up needing to align themselves with the party. So there are all these unaffiliated voters that aren't happy with the parties, but they're, you know, once they get in there, they're still gonna vote, vote for someone. Um, that was kind of a meandering way to answer, but the, the other uh, question you said in the chat about people who didn't vote in the primary might vote for, for Beasley over Bud. I think that's what the Democrats are, are, are counting on. That's something that, that they all hope for. If you look at polling as things are now, it's gonna be pretty close, which means there's going to be a lot of money going into this in the form of those television ads that try to sway you this way or that way, Beasley versus Bud. And Democrats are you know, pretty much gonna vote for Beasley. Republicans are gonna vote for Bud. Those unaffiliates that still vote by party but don't like belonging to a party are probably still gonna vote the same way. So it's that smaller group of voters that the outside spenders are going to try to reach with whatever advertising, whatever mailers, whatever kind of media attention and everything else they can get to, to sway voters. Thanks, Don. So, um, Sunshine, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to, to sort of Ned's question about the hypothetical possibility of a three-way general election in which McCrory is still a candidate um, and we're seeking to evaluate head-to-head -head strength. Don has identified some maybe practical or logistical hurdles just in terms of providing sufficient information to voters if they're choosing and ranking more than just the top candidate. Um, but recognizing those are real challenges or obstacles, but setting them aside for a minute, do you have a sense, Sunshine, of how a three-way race might come out in? So in this you know, it, it, it's difficult to to know without looking at some you know um, rationale for our interpretation of the election results. But I mean, one possibility, as as what was alluded to earlier, is that people know McCrory and don't like McCrory, right? And so that complicates in some ways, this is an example, and in, in, in some ways, I think a little bit about, you know, some of the um, other races where it is this, this same type of phenomenon where you ended up with the more extreme, ideologically extreme Republican winning that now, you know, in the 13th, you know, is is potentially going to make it more difficult for a, a Republican to actually, you know, win that seat because, you know, the the party establishment um, candidate uh, didn't didn't pull it off. And so, the the question is is you know was McCrory the right establishment um, uh, candidate for that type of of um, hypothetical to to go through and and. Um, one suspicion is is that there this was a low information race. People don't have a lot of familiarity um, with the candidates. Um, it does, um, you know, looking ahead, and I know this is not necessarily about you know what the rules of the game are, but you know, Bud is, owns a, a shooting range and a gun store, and and so this question of will there be Republican defections or um, unaffiliated. Um, you know, it, it, it is partly, I think, um, depends on, um, you know, what that information flow and what, what is top of the mind as voters are making decisions going into the fall. And certainly at this moment in time, right, there, there might be some particularly Republican Party establishment that thinking Bud wouldn't, it is not the person that they would necessarily want, you know, carrying the, the party mantle um, at this point. I think I, I do want to come back to one um, one thing to again emphasize, and and that is is the the challenge of thinking about other election rules. And I think he said it, it really well to say like there are these unintended consequences that we have to think through. And and I think it's very important to um, recognize what the burden is for voters to make up their minds in other contests. And, and I think, frankly, primaries themselves um, are perhaps go beyond what I think we ought to be asking um, of 
um, the electorate. I mean, particularly when you start going down the ballot and asking people to, to make a choice when they have very little um, information. And it should not be the responsibility, frankly, of voters to have to go out and choose and learn every single thing about every single candidate. I think it should be the system that makes it easier um, for people to reflect their preferences in, in, in the way that they vote. And so that means that when we look at, at potential solutions and reforms that can better reflect what voter preferences are, is we also have to recognize that those preferences, um, you know, that, that translation from their preferences into candidate choice um, is complicated. And particularly when we're asking them to do it over and over and over again in so many different elections with so many different um, uh, levels, and um, that that can be one of the the real value that a party label brings um, is is to be able to um, allow voters to to use that heuristic um, to make an informed decision. And so uh, a risk I think that that I hope we talk about at some point, maybe outside of the North Carolina context, is that it, you know if we were talking about an instant runoff in a nonpartisan primary, that that just that's a really high burden um, on voters um, to to make choices. And and as Don pointed out, you know we we might disagree about the the role of of ads and spending and and so on, right? Like there's definitely some constraints there. But but when voters don't have sufficient kind of grounding um, and experience with previous voters, and it, it certainly is a time when you're going to increase the 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 impact of of the information that they do get. And so I just want to make sure to get that point out, even though that doesn't really answer your question and it's not really about North Carolina, but just to really, um, that we have to reflect on those unintended um, consequences of, of uh, various um, reforms. Yeah, thanks, Sunshine. I mean, I think the voter burden issue is critical. And as you point out, it is a problem that already pretty badly infects the primary system right? Because we have such low turnout in the primaries, which are so determinative of ultimate choice with so few voters paying any attention. And that, that just doesn't work. It's not working. Um, so Guy, I wanted to invite you to say a little bit more about what you might think as some useful updating. Uh, I mean, you've talked about the system we have being so outdated and that it's time to think about 21st century issues uh, as relevant for structuring the system. But before I open that up for you, can I just clarify one thing? There is a question that has some interesting commentary in it that also I think requires a little clarification because when we talk about um, the possibility of a three-way general election, as Ned teed it up, to try to identify a Condorcet winner, or more to the point, to try to identify the candidate that would do the best in a head-to-head -head matchup against the other two candidates. We are decidedly not talking about a three-way race that one candidate could win with 34% of the vote. That's a plurality election. And we're talking about using some kind of mechanism like a ranked choice ballot to figure out which of those three candidates wins a majority of the head-to-head, -head, you know, win, wins both of the head-to-head -head elections they might compete in. Um, and it gets more complex than that because it might be that there's this cycle and no one candidate beats the other two or whatever. But we're looking for somebody who gets a majority, not just a plurality. So I just want to be clear about that. So Guy, thoughts about what kind of alternatives really seem attractive to you? Sure. I mean, look, the first place you have to think about is why primary elections, at least from my perspective, if you're if we're, if we're in the vein of the discussion that we're having. Um, right. And this is going to build, I think, of, of, off of something that Sunshine said, though, the my ultimate conclusion, I don't want to sully her with that conclusion. So but I but I want to build on that point, you have to ask, look, why primary elections? Is is this, it, and it can't, the justification simply can't be um, to use primaries as a selection mechanism, because there are other types of selection mechanisms, and you, you have to ask, well, why this one, um, all right? What is, the, what, is, what is it that we're trying to do 
when we're selecting the party, and when I use the we here and quotation mark, right? Because in respects, we're we're either selecting a party standard bearer. Uh, so one version of this is this ought to be what the choice of the party itself, or this is something that's necessary for the collective democracy and decision making. So there, then the choice ought to be that of the people themselves, or what we're trying to do is just trying to select the best set of candidates. And if we're trying to do that, then it's not clear that a, an election process is the is the is the mechanism of doing it, right? We could simply have the, the parties themselves choose who are going to be the standard bearers. Um, so the question that we have to ask is, look, what is it that we're trying to do? It may be that all that we're trying to do is just to have a popularity contest, right? Or it may be that we're trying to do is just to, to, to to grab people who are closer to the median of the distribution of the electorate. But we have to have a little bit more consensus on or discussion, certainly at the beginning, and maybe even some consensus on what it is that we're trying to do. And, I, and maybe at the end of the day, the decision might be, look, for the purposes of selecting this, the standard bearer, an election is not the way to go. There are, there are other types of selection mechanisms, and we ought to experiment with those selection mechanisms, maybe in the way that we're also trying to experiment with different sets and structures of elections, right? So I think, I think part of what has been missing in this context is um, discussions about what is it that we're trying to do in American politics, right? What is, what is it that we want? What's the, what, who is it that we're trying to represent? Um, what, are, what are our institutional structures for, um, right? And, and so, uh, and what are the types of upside risks that we want and downside risks that we want to avoid, um, right? So those types of discussions will help us understand the types of updating that need to be done for the 21st century, but, but we need to have those discussions and we need to put those things on the table. So we've got several questions in, in the question and answer feed that I'd like to try and get to. And then I know that each of you has some other things you're interested in chatting about. Um, uh, one question that we've been invited to consider is whether uh, there were, the effect of the invisible primary, if you will, in the North Carolina Senate race. This is a bit of a counter, I suppose, to Sunshine's point about the weakening of the party system, if you will. The, the notion here is that the Democratic Party itself as a party was sufficiently strong to have um, kept Jeff Jackson out of their primary and just let Beasley sort of be the, the designee for the Democratic side. But might Jeff Jackson himself have been uh, a Condorcet candidate in a general election if he'd had that opportunity and hadn't been excluded? by their primary. So um, is that something that Sunshine or Don or Ned or Dee would like to talk about briefly? Yeah, and I would love, I would love to hear uh, Don's uh, comment, but, but I, I, do, um, I do think that, that the, the thing I would just add is I would absolutely um, you know, be willing to take Guy's uh, words exactly and put them in my mouth. So I, I think it was perfectly well said that this is part of what we need to have the discussion about is is exactly right. Um, you know what is the purpose um, and what are the the trade offs, both intentional and unintentional, and and even at different levels, right? When we think about um, you know at um, you know even a, a statewide race versus an you know a, a presidential race versus a local election where we're trying to get you know decisions made on on the like it it it, it just like we want to think about this, um, you know, in, in holistically in terms of what is the goal and and where is it that we we should be designing our system or reforming our system to better translate voter preferences um, into elected officials. We know that there is it is broken right now and it is broken in a number of different places. And the question is, is what is the goal? 
um, that that we want to achieve. And and so I, I think it's 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 great to to kind of step back and and say you know just because we've had a primary doesn't necessarily mean that that is the best selection mechanism um, to keep. And that 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 it, if we were to put instant runoff on that, right? Does that does that really fix the problem? And and why are we holding on to something that um, you know there isn't even with instant runoff, you're still going to run into these these issues. Now, um, you know, I'll, I'll let Don um, answer the question about, um, you know, Beasley versus uh, Jackson, but but it is a, you know, in terms of the emergence of the primary system in the first place, part of it was about, you know, uh, do, do we want to rely on party leadership um, exclusively? And, and how can we, um, you know, look for even if it's just a popularity contest to get a sense of like, are the party leaders doing uh, doing the right thing? And and so, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Don. Yeah, the the Jeff Jackson Cherry Beasley thing was interesting to watch. Um, Jackson had been he's a state senator, um, so to see how when if, if people who aren't familiar, he considered running against. Um, the primary of Cal Cunningham, and then it was, you know, I think it was Schumer that advised him to just raise money in the dark windowless basement, decided not to do that. And we saw what happened when Cal Cunningham was the Democratic nominee. So uh, Jackson did want to try it this time and, and the party, it's invisible, but we know that it was, you know, the party themselves decided that Beasley was who they wanted and, and not Jackson. And I think that doesn't just happen at the federal level, it happens at the state and local level. Um, I used to cover Durham city government, which is a majority blue um, city and county. And they're someone that actually I was going to mention when we talked about ranked choice voting, who tried ranked choice voting with they were appointing somebody to either a board or empty council seat. I remember just the, the council members going through and being like, why do we want to do this? How, do, how would this work? And it worked well for them on this very this very small level of just the council members doing ranked choice voting for their the person they appointed. Durham also has a nonpartisan municipal primary and then the election. So that again ties to what we were talking about with voters, um, getting the information, paying attention, and then turnout, and you have to really care about it. Um, so the local election is an example of how do you how do you test these different things and and how how interested are, are voters, potential voters, going to be in, in that kind of system. But compared to the Jackson Beasley firm is kind of in a similar example of the fact that it's an all, not all, it's very, you know, excessively democratic area that the party will decide before people even run. And it can be anything from appointing somebody to an empty uh, seat in the state house or senate. And then the person runs unopposed in the primary. And that's happened in Durham. It's happened a lot of different ways. Covering state government, I was surprised at how many lawmakers got there first because they were appointed from their local area before they ran, and then they ran unopposed. So this elect all 170 seats in the state legislature up for election this year. A lot of the leadership, it's almost all of the Republican leadership are unopposed, so they already won. And so there's like a much, you know, looking at the state and local level, I think are some answers of how of how this can play out and what, what works and what doesn't. Don, you've just given us some additional examples of the ways in which the existence of a two-party primary system has dramatic effects in shaping our electoral choices for no reason other than a historical artifact, really, as Guy said earlier, that it just is a system designed centuries ago and it continues to persist without a lot of real um, reflection about its impacts. Another impact may be the decision that Burr himself made to retire, right? The outgo, this is an open seat for the North Carolina Senate because Burr chose to retire. And he's not the only one. We can look to examples in a number of other states where moderate senators have chosen not to seek reelection. And, um, that's an impact maybe we ought to think about and talk about briefly. Ned, is that something that you wanted to also yeah. to consider? Thanks, Steve. I mean, I do think um, you know, one of the reasons why I've been particularly interested in North Carolina this cycle is because it is one of these five states, like Ohio being another one, where you have an establishment traditional Republican, Rob Portman in Ohio, 
Richard Burr in North Carolina, Toomey in Pennsylvania, Shelby in Alabama, and uh, I guess out Blunt in Missouri, all abandoning their posts. And maybe they all have personal reasons. Um, and I think this goes back to the point that, was it Sunshine or, or Don? One of you, I think, mentioned the idea that McCrory might have just been a really bad <laughs> candidate, that North Carolina just didn't like him. And maybe that's true of Burr as well. I know Burr had a little bit of scandal maybe in his past, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Portman, on the other hand, you know, doesn't seem quite as problematic in, in Ohio. But it's, and I think there is this larger structural point, and it does relate to the notion of the two party system. And it goes back to, I think, Guy and Sunshine's point about, you know, what are we trying to do here in an election? What's our purpose? And, and my thinking on this channels the, the political scientist Robert Dahl in particular, and also something called May's theorem, which is sort of a technical aspect of political science, as I understand it, where if everybody has equal voting rights as we want in our constitutional democracy, and there are only two choices on the ballot, then the, the choice that gets more votes rather than fewer, the majority choice is the fairest to the equality of, of voting rights. It's a, sort of an intuitive idea, right? Because otherwise you're kind of counting <laughs> extra weight if you let the, 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 the candidate with the fewer votes prevail to the candidate with, over the more votes. So, and, and our two party system, when it works is designed to, to narrow the field to just two options, each backed by a party that the voters in November choose. Um, and that might be a system that works if both parties believe in the system itself. And, and maybe we just have to, you know, a part of our 21st century world is now we've, we don't have really a Republican party anymore. We have a MAGA party. When the MAGA party is defined, you know, by a lot of new ideologies, um, a kind of nativism, a populism a strand of, of, of politics, and also this sort of anti-democracy strand, which is willing to repudiate elections when they don't like if their candidate has won. So I worry that a two-party system is viable if one of the two parties it just doesn't believe in two-party democracy and wants to just always rule regardless of what the what the voters want. And so I think with that in mind, you know, even if McCrory or Burr is not uh, a particularly good um, standard bearer for this dwindling wing of the former Republican Party, um, the question is whether or not we, as system wide, for the sake of the voters, we want there to be more than just the two choices between the MAGA party and the Democratic Party. Do we want, you know, because, you know, the, is there a Liz Cheney, Mitt Romney party somewhere in the middle um, that still believes in democracy that's the remnants of the old part, uh, Republican Party? And if not, is our system sustainable going forward? So I think North Carolina is kind of putting that question forward as a, in a kind of a preview for what we're going to see in 24 on the presidential level as well. Ned, can I ask you about that? Because one way of resolving that, one way of looking at what's going on with the Republican Party right now is just to look at it as an intra-party fight, um, right? That's just being outsourced to the electorate. Um, and part of the question is how much should we trust the electorate to resolve those intra-party fights? So the one solution is just to internalize the intra-party fight and to say to the political leaders, look, you solve it. So if you want to be the MAGA party, that's fine. Um, but, um, but there are many of you who don't. Um, and so really the appeal to the electorate may be fueling the MAGA part of the party, um, right? So one option is just to allow the parties themselves to select their standard bearers. And the likely outcome of that is one, I would say more likely than not outcome of it is that the Republican Party would be more of the traditional Republican Party pre-Trump. So that's one, I mean, one solution is sort of like the type of structural Condorcet approach, but an, or, or an open party, right, open primary approach. But another solution is just to simply allow the, the party leaders to decide. Um, and the way that, you know, like Dawn was talking about with respect to what the Democrats did, 
uh, by saying, look, we're going to, yeah, we're going to have a primary, but we're going actually going to make it as meaningless as possible uh, because we're going to try to decide ex ante who we want as our standard bearer and not to leave it to the electorate. So I'm very interested to have this conversation continue. Let me just inject one thing from one of our audience members, which was to just ask whether what we are wrestling with today is in part due to the realignment of the Republican Party that has been going on for some time today. And so that's just a piece of this thread, although, Guy, you're, you know, talking about different ways the party could respond and, and the questioner is suggesting there's something more inevitable about what's happening than Guy, you were describing. But I just want to get that out there as this conversation continues. So. Yeah, so if I could just try to respond really quickly to Guy's point and bring that in. I mean, I think, Guy, if, if, if the Republican Party establishment in control of the nomination process, regardless of primary voters, tried to, you know, anoint, uh, I mean, just you know, imagine if they tried to anoint Liz Cheney, the nominee for 24, instead of Donald Trump or, or Ron DeSantis. They, they, I mean, Trump already threatened to bolt the Republican Party and form his own MAGA party if the Republican Party was going to be the, you know, the establishment Romney party. So, you know, I think we're, I think, I, I just don't think the Republican, I don't think the two party system can survive with the Republican Party being, you know, the, um, the Romney party and, you know, uh, and the Paul Ryan party. The only question is whether there's going to be a Trump uh, DeSantis MAGA party and a Democratic party. And the question is whether we still have just those two parties or, or whether there's a third option, I think. I think there is like the inner party fight with the Republican Party is playing out in, in the primaries. And and I think Republicans like that that aren't aren't Romney and Cheney and you know aren't Trump and the MAGA group. There's a whole bunch of them in the middle that were there before Trump and are going to be there after Trump. And they just want to keep their power and we're going to go with what's going to help them win. So if it looks like a Trump endorsement continues to help them win, they're going to keep that that part of the base. If it looks like they don't need it anymore, bye. You know, I think like what it's going to come down to, like you want to be in office and you're going to do what you can to remain in office the same like I think both parties have different different wings of it and it's going to you know end up playing out like how much do you need them are you going to lose if you disavow from from that then you're not going to do that so I think there's self-preservation for people within within the party too um, as far as how how this is going to go and certainly a Trump endorsement is what have worked for a lot of people in the primary and it didn't for others you know yeah, and I, I, I want to just say, like, I, I do think that rather so that that um, it is the case that we have a system with these layers of primaries and low turnout in which you can exploit the system in order for, um, you know, Trump supporters to to be able to to win and and that an entirely reasonable, you know, um, reform in my mind would be a more a simpler you know two party system where it is fought out within the parties and even if the result is a additional realignment to a maga party that then you go to the majority system and so so yes it is the case that you could have um you know a split in a minor party and a you know ross perot or you know like have an independent candidate that emerges but we also know how that works out you know in the american system and that is you know that that doesn't doesn't last very long. It either it either takes over the party um, or it doesn't last very long and, and, and splits a vote. So so I, I think the fundamental um, problem right now is that that when you are in a system in which you have such a small percentage of the electorate making the decision that that can be and I don't want to say manipulated because they're still voters. Right. But that surge that we saw in, in North Carolina among voters, you know, that was that was, I think, driven by right an attempt to to, um, you know, support um, Trump, um, you know, endorsed candidates. And and so when you have such levels of enthusiasm and 
Um, it, but it is not equally distributed across um, the the electorate and a system in which you know you can you can win with you know a number of votes that that is just a tiny proportion of the the population. That to me is the recipe for um, real concern. Yeah, um, of course. You but know, but what... the solution I think doesn't necessarily have to be an additional complicated layer of still allowing a very small person because I, I just think that there's any system in which the decision making is left to a small number of voters is vulnerable to um, to kind of being uh, I mean maybe maybe layering on majority win but even with majority win I just think that when you're you're down to a set of voters um, being able to to drive and and it's not about the competence of the voter. I want to be really clear. We should not be expecting voters to have to bear this burden. Um, and and so you know it's it's not about an, an inability to make decisions. It is just about um, us expecting um, too much when people have their lives to live and and they should be able to express their preferences um, more easily than than what we expect in in the current system. So we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I want to just offer each of you a chance to put before us any other question or concern you have or comment. Um, if I may just go, I'll just build on something that Sunshine just said now and something that she put on the table earlier, which is, look, I think we could think about reform across a number of different levels, right? So it might make sense, for example, for the reform that Ned is advocating to have it at the general election level, right? That that might, you know, that might be that might be really smart and and have more in the length of the outcomes that we're looking for. It might be something very different to be thinking about it at the primary level, right? Or we might want to think about local ver differently from from state and state differently from presidential. So I think all of those um, layers, like, or to put, or to, to tie that point back together, in the, in the terms of sunshine articulated, what are the types of burdens that we want to put on voters? And if we're placing the same level of burdens on voters at all of these levels, then we're we may be asking much more than our system can bear. But we might say it's fair to ask a lot of voters at the presidential level or at the at the general election level for. Um, a statewide election, but much less to ask the same thing of them, right, to be fully informed, et cetera, of eight, nine candidates in, in a primary, right? So I think, you know, again, those, that discussion is an important one. I think working out the answers to that discussion will lead us to the types of um, solutions that might make sense for contemporary democracy. Great, thanks, Guy. Ned, Don? I think that's a great, Don, do you want to say, because that's a nice uh, sense of forward momentum, a sense of shared purpose and 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 looking forward to future, com um, you know, conversations to implement the, what Guy was just talking about, I think. I think anything, if we're encouraging more people to vote, make it um, not more complicated, make it easier. So do all everything on the back end and then present it in a way that's that's easy, that's convenient, and that actually will engage the most people in it. I think is that that's the you know well, ideal I'll, end result. If we can ever get there, who knows? I'll note just really briefly that one of our questions was about the possibility of making voting mandatory as Australia does. And so Don, you're talking about just making it more attractive rather than making it mandatory. The idea of mandatory voting um, would solve some of these issues, but it would bring with it its own attendant uh, difficulties. And, and I'm confident the political resistance would be pretty great in our country today. And um, Americans don't like being told what to do. I mask wearing was, was one thing. Voting would be another. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of the questions and comments in the Q&A. And in fact, there were some nice comments in there as well. And we sure appreciate the chance we've had this, we've had to have this conversation. Um, we thank those audience members who joined. And, and let me just, on behalf of Election Law at Ohio State, thank Don and Sunshine and Guy and Ned for being part of this. And we hope these kinds of conversations will continue. We are at a point where
there are some real threats and some potential opportunities for figuring out how to make our electoral processes do what we need them to do for us. So keep up your good work, everybody. And, and again, thanks for being with us today. Thank you.